This is Rocky Snyder. At the tone, leave your name and message and I'll get back to you. Your brain, for example, is so minute, Baldrick, that if a hungry cannibal cracked your head open, there wouldn't be enough inside to cover a small water biscuit. Yeah, and my name is Rocky Snyder, and I am in Santa Cruz, California. We've got a training facility. It's actually quite quiet right now for obvious COVID reasons. We can do our training outside or online, so I don't think we'll have too many interruptions as we go through the next so close to an hour, I guess. And I don't do too well in a seated position, so... Fortunately, there's not much of an elevation change when I go to stand either. So I'm just going to tilt this camera up. I have recorded this session and it's my intention to put it on our YouTube channel in case you have got somebody that you've told this about, but they couldn't uh, come into this, this meetup today. Well, you can go to Rocky Snyder CSCS. That's the channel on YouTube and you'll be able to find this probably in about a week or so. It'll be a little special edition off to the side. If you've got questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on my chat window off to the side here. So at any point in time, you've got some questions, go ahead and type them into the chat room and near the end, uh, unless it's really important that I answer them right then and there in the moment, uh, I'll try and kind of check those out. But in the end, we'll try and review those, those questions. And I'll be sure to to say them out loud and so on. So everybody knows what the questions are before going on with the, with the response. Okay, so this is Brain Training 101. That means that I am not an expert in the brain by any stretch of the imagination. I think I've had one all my life, but that's about the, the extent of my expertise. Um, although we do a good deal of movement in our studio and we infuse a bit of what we call motor neurology, which is the study of movement and the brain and how they feed back and forth toward each other. So if you're thinking that we're going to do a whole bunch of memory games or we're going to do some kind of cognitive tests, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's not really what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be really trying to get a better understanding of how we can send better signals to our brain so that the brain can interpret or, or understand what stimuli is coming in and then try and create a response so that the body is going to reply in kind based on the stimuli it receives. And now we, we receive stimuli to the brain through a number of ways. The biggest, if you can consider, is the eyes. An interesting little side note, the eyes are the only living part of our body that's exposed to the outside. You know, our skin, has an outer layer, the epidermis, which are dead nerve cells or dead skin cells. The dead skin cells, we've got dead hair cells, our nails are dead cells, deep inside they're alive, but anything exposed to the outside of our body is pretty much dead. It keeps us protected with the exception of our eyes, interestingly enough. And it's why we have tear ducts because that water helps to keep that living cell alive and somewhat protected, of course. But the eyes are fascinating because that's where a lot of the stimuli of our world is coming through. In fact, somewhere about 90% of our balance itself comes through our eyes. All right, so that's one way. Then the other way in which we get it, of course, our senses, right? Acoustic, uh, and taste, smell, and touch. So with touch, we've got all of these nerve endings that are just below the surface of our skin. We also have what's called mechanoreceptors, which tell us where our body is in space. For instance, I can put my hands behind my head and I can wiggle my fingers without actually looking to see what they're doing because those mechanoreceptors are giving my brain information that they're moving through space. So we're gonna look at how do we stimulate the proprioceptors of the body? How do we stimulate our visual center? And not so much acoustic, but right beside the, the ear drum and deep inside the ear, we have our vestibular system. And the vestibular system helps us know uh, which way is up, 
and where we're moving through space and of course you know our balance so we're going to be looking at that but we've got a lot of things if you go to, to youtube for instance and you just do a little search for brain training there's going to be a whole bunch of things come up now just like any other google search you can really take time and sift through to find out what's accurate information and what may not be accurate and maybe a lot of fluff and unfortunately a lot of the brain training elements or skills or exercise that are out there seem to be quite fluffy and not necessarily doing what it is they say they're going to be doing i mean memory games are great don't get me wrong but there's uh the, the research that I've read is not necessarily conclusive that a lot of those types of things are going to help with the longevity of the brain. Of course, we want to stimulate the brain and there's many ways to do it. So that's what we're gonna do today. But before we do that on my little whiteboard here, hopefully you can see it, but I'll read down the list. Here are the things that are going to degrade brain health. So if nothing else, if we can avoid these elements, to degrade our nervous system, then we're better off. So one of them is chronic lack of sleep. So how much sleep do you get a night? And how much real deep sleep do you get a night? If you suffer from sleep apnea or insomnia, then you can probably attest to the fact that your cognitive skills are compromised because of the lack of sleep. So children generally need a lot more hours, 12 to 16 for infants and toddlers, 10 to 12 hours for grade school. Then we get into maybe the eight to 12 hours for high school. And then somewhere in our adulthood, as long as we get somewhere between seven to nine hours of sleep, we're doing rather well. So how many hours of sleep do you get? You'd be surprised your cognitive ability will improve with better sleep patterns. We've got prolonged periods of stress. <laughs> Rather coincidental considering the things that are going on in this world in this, in this year with uh, quarantines and shelter in place and so on. In Santa Cruz, if you're not in this area, if you're tuning in from other places, we have some amazing wildfires that are burning uh, somewhat out of control, although they're getting more contained and our air quality around here has been compromised considerably throughout the entire state of California. Over a million acres are burning currently and the air quality, well, there's thousands of miles of smoke plumes going off around the world right now because of what's happening in this state. Add to that if you're a business owner or just a regular worker, and now not only has COVID interrupted your work or got you out of work, well, the air quality has added to that. So there's a lot of stress around right now, and so there's many people that are feeling it, and it is rather prolonged. So trying to manage that in some form or other, whether it's through meditation, talking to counselors or friends or whatever, anything that you can do to reduce your stress. And of course, exercise is a great way of doing that too. So not to preach to the choir or anything, but getting out and moving your body in a safe way and uh, through multi-directional movements especially can really help to reduce the stress. Then we have dehydration. At the beginning of the hour, I recommended people go before we begin and get themselves a cup of water. Now, dehydrated brain, so the brain is primarily water, if you consider, in fact, the, the body is primarily composed of water. And as we dehydrate, cognitive functions may very well diminish. So always having water through the day in some form or other, primarily just pure, nice water would be great. So consider that for brain health. A lot of people don't think of that. They just think, oh, I need to stay hydrated because of my muscles. And the brain is not a muscle, but nonetheless, it really needs a lot of energy, fluid, and support. And the last one on the list, well, this is where diet comes into play. So we've already talked about movement being a key toward helping circulation, staying hydrated, giving it plenty of rest. Well, when it comes to eating, your diet, if it's primarily a high sugar diet, and the sugar I'm speaking of is mainly fructose, whether it's the high 
fructose corn syrup or just fructose in general, the simple sugars found in say candy and chocolate, we'll wanna be moderate with that. And if we can reduce that intake, all the better, because that will actually degrade brain function as well. Not to say that sugar is bad because the brain does actually live on sugar, it's just not that type of sugar. So having a solid diet, I know it sounds like the same old thing we hear, but we just need to drill it into our system more and more until we fully grasp the gravity of the, the triad that we're talking about. Plenty of rest, proper diet, and exercise. All right. So you've been, you've been given the sermon, so to speak. Let's get into really more of the brain itself. Let's do some drills and see if by doing these drills, there's some improvement with how your brain regulates information to your body. I guess I should probably explain that a little bit before we actually jump in so you understand what it is we're trying to achieve. Part of our brain, we'll call it the old brain, compared to the new brain. That old brain developed before we became aware that we were even human. So before sentient awareness, before language, abstract thoughts, constructs like time, before these even developed, we had the old brain. The old brain is like the cerebellum, the brain stem. In between, we've got midbrain pons, medulla oblongata, if you remember your anatomy courses, right? The old brain, that's where the basic elements of life exist. That's where it's regulated. So in terms of your autonomic nervous system, your heart is beating right now without the conscious mind having to control it. Your breathing, your circulatory system, your digestive system, all the things that keep us going are being controlled outside or deep within in the old brain and not in the conscious new brain. Now they communicate back and forth with each other in some ways, but what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna try and address sending signals somewhat to the old brain. It's a lot more complex than that, but let's just keep it simple. Now the cerebellum controls accuracy, balance, and coordination. We can consider it the ABCs. So we're gonna look at that. We're gonna find out how well you balance. And we'll do a few drills uh, after we find out your quality of balance. Then we'll do a drill and then we'll see if by doing that drill, did your balance improve? And that might tell you that, oh, this drill is actually feeding great stimuli into my brain. And it's gonna help not only provide better balance, but it's probably gonna help provide better stimuli through all of the systems that that area of the brain controls. So we can actually do physical movement to stimulate areas of the brain so that they regulate better signals to the rest of our body and not just the muscles. So that's kind of like, that's the sign language for amazing. And, 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 and that's what I think of every time when I consider that doing certain movements or drills can actually upgrade our ability to, to function in the neurological system so that it regulates better, better action in our body. Now, that autonomic nervous system I spoke of, well, that is always kind of like a thermostat, if you will. It's, it's on the rise or it drops down. And there is this central point, we'll kind of call it like the zone, like athletes do. When you're in the zone, everything is good. All your movements are clutch and everything, the ball's going in the basket. It's being hit over the, over the back wall of the park or whatever sport you're doing. It's like when you are in that sweet spot. And so with the autonomic nervous system, the way I think about it is there's a sweet spot right in the middle. If we go too high above the sweet spot, we go into what's called a sympathetic response. And this is where our threat system gets elevated. And this is where when we get more in this area, the brain is establishing information and saying, whoa, this is considerably a threatened situation. So when we're threatened, what do we do? We kind of pull ourselves inward. We, we get ready for whatever is coming at us. And we pull closer and closer into that fetal position, right? If we think about the fetal position, it's taking all of our viscera, uh, our soft tissue, everything that's exposed 
to the world and we're closing in to protect it. So the back of my head protects my face. I pull my chin in, my throat is covered. I draw my shoulders in to protect my heart and lungs and the bony part of my rib cage and spine protect me from there. My hips pull in and I'm protecting my internal organs and reproductive system. We pull into that position, into flexion, when we get higher and higher onto that sympathetic threat response. Now, the opposite, as we drop down, we start to go out of that position. And actually, when we're in the zone, we are pulled out of that fetal position and we're more into like the sign for victory. We're open, we're ready. Now, of course, we drop down below the zone and get into the parasympathetic, down into this region. Well, then we become really lethargic. Things don't start to really, really upgrade. Everything gets really quite slow. I mean, that's a, a simple way of explaining it. Now, most of us with stressed lives are living up in this threat response area all the time. You'll know it because you're, you've got high blood pressure. You've got heart issues. You've got tight muscles. Maybe your balance is off. There's a whole bunch of signs for that because the autonomic nervous system is actually controlling all that. It's controlling the length of your muscles, how much force the muscles can produce even. If we get into a place where we're really threatened, we don't actually produce as much force. Our muscles are more restricted and therefore our range of motion is restricted. And that will throw our balance off as well. So we can use this understanding of what the nervous system is doing in terms of how it regulates us if we're threat response or if we're in the zone by how well we balance. That kind of makes sense. So one simple way to balance or to test your balance is to lift one leg off the ground. And now I have a chair nearby. So if you feel like you are very compromised with your balance and you're not sure about taking one foot off the ground, what you could do is just bring your feet very close together or one foot in front of the other and that in itself will keep both feet on the floor, but it'll give you some semblance of challenge. And if you find that, okay, I can lift my foot off the floor, great. Let's just see how long you can do that and get a sense of how relaxed you are while you're balancing with one leg off the ground. Are you wobbling around? Is there a lot of movement through your foot? Is it trying to find stability by wiggling all over the place? Are you tightening up? Just for the sake of it, let's switch over to your other foot. And most likely there's gonna be subtle differences here. Chances are you've done one side, the first one you went to is probably the side you're really good at because there's patterns that we have developed subconsciously that we choose and just get a sense, okay, what's that balance like? All right, so let's just do a little activity that involves the eyes. And then let's see how that feeds into your balance. Now, there's going to probably be three outcomes. One, nothing's changed. Nothing happened. My balance is still the same. Two, my balance got worse. I'm actually wobbling a lot more. Whatever you just did with this visual drill actually put me into a threat response where I'm not balancing very well. And three, actually my balance really improved. Whatever stimuli I just fed to my brain, actually it liked it and improved my balance. So let's just do a simple one. We're gonna use the end of your thumb and you're gonna be standing with your arm somewhere out around the, the end range of arm reach. You can have a soft bend to your elbow if you choose to. And what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be staring with both eyes open and staring at the tip of your thumb. And you're going to make a circle around in a clockwise manner and you should be able to see it. It has, shouldn't be too big where you lose track of it with one eye. Just do that a couple times. Then recheck your balance. Was there an improvement? Was there no change or did it get worse? Now what we just did though, is we took the eyes through all the dimensions of movement. It can move up and down, side to side, and over in the diagonals. By doing a circle, we kind of hit all of those spots. Now it's not to say that just taking your eyes around in a circle, if you had your balance worsen, 
uh, means that moving your eyes in a circle is not what your body needs. Maybe there's somewhere in that circle that fed into a place where, where your brain just said, ooh, there's, for whatever reason, there is a little threat in that area. So it doesn't mean that I should stay away from it. It may mean that I need to find out where it is that I have good balance of response and where do I have not so good. So let's do that. Even though we just went around in a circle, what we're gonna do is you're just gonna take your thumb about eye level and you're just going to stare at it. By the way, you're staring with both feet standing on the ground, by the way. If, if you tried balancing on one leg doing the circle, I apologize, you really need to have both feet on the floor. And all you're just gonna do is keep your head still, don't turn it up, but hold for about five or six seconds looking at that thumbnail. Then check your balance. Was there improvement? All right, and you might wanna make a note. When my eyes went up, my balance improved, or it, it got worse, or nothing happened. Now, keeping your head still, look downward on your thumb for about five or six seconds. And you may feel that just by looking downward, or, or whichever direction we're choosing right now, that's good, that you could already feel how your balance was being challenged. So check your single leg balance after that. That actually feels better to me. Now you could say, well, you just keep on doing it. You're gonna get better at it because you're practicing single leg balance, possibly. But over the course of time, in my experience, uh, that's actually not the case because I'll put somebody's eyes in a different position and suddenly their balance is compromised. So then that gives me an idea. Okay, well, we need to feed some stimuli. We need to make that better. We don't wanna just avoid it, but I definitely don't wanna do that before anybody begins a workout or they go for a walk. I might wanna do that in the middle of their workout, uh, but definitely not to set them up before they start moving their body. I'll do the areas that their body is actually going to feed really positive feedback into it where their balance was improved. All right, let's just go left to right now. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take my hand over to my side and, and I'm going to bring it over to my left side, keeping my head facing forward. I'm just gonna take my eyes over to the left side. And I wanna make sure that the where I see with my right eye that the bridge of my nose is not is not hiding that thumb. So I don't wanna take it so far to the side. After five or six seconds, check your balance again. Pretty good. I'm gonna take it over to the other side, keeping my head still, facing forward, staring at that thumbnail. All right, and check your balance again. Interesting. I don't know if you can see, but I'm starting to wobble. So taking my eyes over to the right, very interesting. Uh, and not to get too deep into it, but if I checked my neck range of motion, oh, I find that I'm stiff going to the left. And if I'm staring straight ahead, my eyes would actually be having to turn right to stay looking straight ahead if my head turned left. I have restriction by turning my head left. I also have a problem getting my eyes to the right. These are fed together. So if I actually worked on opening up my neck a little bit, it may help with my visual field to the right. It may provide better stimuli to my brain. And my balance might improve. This is what I'm talking about brain training. So if you're thinking that we're going to, again, do any memory drills, then that's not it. We're actually just dealing with the neurology of the, of, of the brain and how we feed movement and, and information back and forth with our physical frame to the body. Okay, so we've just done four places. You can play around with the diagonals as well, but this is just an example of what we can do. So that, in, it, in essence, getting the visual field, which 90% of our balance is coming from, if we can get our eyes to improve what information they receive and send to the brain, our balance may actually be improving. And therefore, the information sent to the brain is going to improve. Hopefully, that makes a lot of sense to you. Let's do maybe one more visual exercise. And rather than use balance as a determinant, or as an assessment and a reassessment, let's instead use maybe a range of motion. Now there's, and what I mean by that is we're just going to check, let's just do shoulder range of motion. So I'm just going to keep my arms straight and I'm just going to raise it up in front of my body overhead and get a feeling and go ahead and do this several times so that you can't use that, oh, I'm just warming up kind of excuse that it got better or whatnot. Check in with that shoulder. Check in with the other shoulder. Hmm. 
one of them is going to have probably just a hint more restriction. One's going to go maybe a little bit further. And as you can see, I'm not trying to muscle through this. I'm not trying to crank it as far as I can. I'm just getting a general sense of when does my range of motion kind of hit a, that cardboard wall? And what I've found is my left shoulder is actually a little bit more restricted. Yeah. So I'm going to use this restricted side as my assessment tool. And what we're going to do is we're just going to work on allowing the eyes to converge and then move apart. We'll call divergence. So convergence and divergence. And a simple one is just taking your thumb out at arm reach, head looking straight at it with the eyes, and you're just going to bring your thumbnail toward the tip of your nose. And then you're going to draw it away. Trying to keep focused on the thumbnail at the entire time. Now it may go a little double vision when you bring it toward your thumb, but just see what that's like. Now I'm gonna use my other hand and do a few more. Just because it's my left shoulder that I'm looking to assess. And I'll use both arms just to see. Okay, and then just check your range of motion after that. Okay, what was occurring prior to that was a little catch in my shoulder, I'd say a little pinch, and that pinch is gone. Kind of curious, if anybody is receiving any kind of output that is similar to that, or it's gotten worse, however it is, if you wanna throw it in the chat room, that's great. Okay, so we've worked on improving your balance by incorporating visual drills. Let's work on the vestibular system for a moment and we'll feed stimuli into your inner ear and see if that improves well we'll do balance but we'll also do range of motion uh, the vestibular system well they get that from the vestibules right vestibules are those chambers in a church and hence we've got chambers in our inner ear so and they're very vestibule shaped chambers so hence the name vestibular system now those chambers, well, they, they can hold fluid and they can hold these little things called autoliths, which are kind of little stones in the ears. And as they move, they hit nerve endings. And those nerve endings send signals to the brain to tell us what kind of movement's going on. So when you tilt your head forward, certain fluid moves forward. And then there's other chambers that are shaped to move and send the fluid kind of sloshing one way or another when your head goes side to side. Then we've got these other ones that are kind of shaped in a different direction that when you turn your head, that sloshes the fluid around in those chambers. So it's very much like a, a gyroscope in a way or a navigation in a plane where there's pitch, roll, and yaw, those three dimensional spaces we've got in our inner ears. So let's just check in with that. And what we're gonna do is you're gonna stare at the screen. Hopefully it's somewhere around head level or so. Even if it's down a little bit, that's okay. And what you're gonna be doing is standing comfortably with your feet side by side. You're gonna start with your head tilt, uh, head straight ahead and you're gonna quickly tilt it downward while staring at the screen. And then slowly bring it back up to center. And then do that again, tilt, slowly bring it back up. And one more time, tilt fast and slowly bring it back up. Check your balance on your single leg. How was that? Are you noticing an improvement, decrease, nothing happened. All right, let's go in the opposite direction. So you're staring at the screen. You're gonna tilt your head quickly backwards and then slowly bring it forward. Tilt it back and slowly bring it forward. We'll do it one more time and bring it forward. We can check your balance. That was actually a really nice response for me. I don't know if you can see it in the screen, but you'll notice when my body relaxes, I'm standing on my left leg right now, and that's the leg that I've been testing. And everything's just really nice and relaxed. Out of curiosity, I'm gonna check my shoulder. That feels really nice right now. And this is telling me that my autonomic nervous system is actually getting me closer and closer to that zone. Okay, let's go side to side. So what you're gonna be doing is you're going to be turning your head, rotating it to your right, but try to stare at some object on the screen and then slowly bring it back. Turn it quickly, slowly bring it back. 
And some of us might find it's very hard to stay tracked with our eyes locked on a target while the head moves. It gives us a sense that, wow, my ability to what we call disassociate, to move my head in one direction while my eyes stay locked on a target needs some work. Because primitively speaking, in order for our ancestors to survive, it was really important for us to lock on targets, even while we're trying to run away. So, or even while we're trying to run toward, because it was either going to be a food source we're hunting down, or it was going to be a predator trying to eat us. So these are all primitive movements that we should own within our frame. And staring at a screen for numerous amounts of hours through the day can have a tendency to bring our focus and our peripheral vision into a much more tunnel vision kind of way. Now that you did that rotational to the right with your head, check your balance or check your range of motion. Now let's go to the other side, staring straight ahead, rotate to the left, slowly come back. Rotate left, slowly come back and left. And then Whoa. All right, there it is again for me. Rotating my head to the left meant my eyes had to travel right. And if you recall, bringing my eyes to the right, I struggled to do in my range of motion here, is starting to catch again. So I've got to figure out what's going on with that off on my own time, I'll do that. Instead for you, if you've found ones that really benefit you, that gave you better balance, crazy enough as this may seem, uh, then those may be the, the kind of the big buckets we so call, that uh, those are the ones you might wanna do before you go exercise. Things that are gonna give you better balance, better range of motion. All right, so we just gave you a hint of what you can do with your vestibular system. There's a whole bunch of drills that are involved with that. We just did a little bit for the visual field. The proprioception is, interestingly enough, we're just going to pretend that you're in the shower and we're going to wake up the nerve endings all through your body. And then let's see how your balance is and your range of motion is after that. So you're just going to take your hand and you're just gonna rub all along your hands, the back of the hands, the wrists, through the forearms on both sides, around the elbow, the arms, underarms. And you don't have to spend a lot of time, but honestly, what happens is the less we move our body, you've been sitting there watching or standing in place, there's a lot of areas of your body that aren't getting movement. And then what happens to your brain? If you're not moving, then what kind of stimuli are you sending? Very little. So lack of movement decreases how much stimuli the brain is receiving. All the reason to exercise, right? So now I'm just gonna get across my chest, down into my midsection, underarm, see if I can't get around my back a little bit. You know, we didn't even deal with the head, but we can get into our face as if we have face cloth around the back, through the throat, and then we're just gonna go down around the hips and thighs. And all I'm doing is just waking up those nerve endings, and I'll even just get onto the bottom of my foot. Of course, if your balance is a little compromised, you got that chair or wall nearby, that would be great. And there we go. All right, so I just work, woke up all those surface area nerve endings. Out of curiosity, check your balance now. Check your range of motion. How was that? All just by stimulating the nerve endings all through your body. In essence, we are waking up your brain's ability to know where the body was in space. Imagine walking through your house in the middle of the night, trying to go to the kitchen to get a glass of water and power is out. Now you've got a sense of where your layout is, but you're not gonna be walking very fast to get to the refrigerator or to the sink. You're going to be walking with certain apprehension and caution because you don't really understand exactly where things are. Well, kind of the same thing is occurring the less we move our body or the less connection the brain has with the body. Something called the neural map is this idea that the brain has this idea of, of where the body is and it's mapped it all out but areas that don't get a lot of movement are, are gonna be blurred on that map. And so we're not going to have a concise understanding of where things are. 
And there's plenty of times we've walked around and suddenly we found ourselves bumping our shoulder against the door frame or bumping into something that we had no idea that our leg was actually that far over. So simply doing this, we call it rub and scrub. By rubbing the body all around, it's a nice way of enhancing stimuli to the brain. And if you've ever studied martial arts or, or some forms of yoga, then you're going to find that there's something similar in regards to how they conduct the class or their instruction. There's going to be some kind of, whether it's tapping on the body or just some type of, of tactile feedback that occurs. Okay, so we've dealt a little bit with proprioception, the ability to know where we are in space, the vision, and the vestibular system. Now, let's get into a little fun one. And this is gonna have you move around a little bit. And this is going to be all about coordination. Now I've got this chart here that I'm going to put up in front of the camera. And on that chart are lines. I should point out, by the way, that a lot of this information I get from a teacher of mine by the name of Dr. Eric Cobb. He has what's called the Z Health Educational System, and it's all about motor neurology, all about helping trainers, movement and manual therapists, uh, helping their clients not only move better, but really um, be healthier. And they, incur they incorporate a lot of the drills that we're doing, this being one of them. Now, this is a coordination chart. And what you see on this chart are vertical lines, and they, we've got columns and rows. And there is also a star symbol that is either on one side of the line or the other, or sometimes you'll see the star resting on the vertical line itself. And what we'll be doing is we'll be reading across from left to right, and then down to the next one and down to the next one during the next 30 seconds. Now with this chart though, what you'll be doing is as you read left to right going across the screen, you're going to be saying out loud, now we've got the microphones muted so no one's gonna hear your scream or anything or so you can be as loud as you want to. But when the star is on the left side of the vertical line, you're gonna take your hands and you're gonna clap on your left. And when the star is on the right side, you're gonna take your hands and you're gonna clap on the right. And when the star is somewhere on the vertical line, you just clap your hands in the middle. At the same time, however, you're going to verbally be saying left, right, center. And you're going to try and do this as quickly as you can. Don't worry if you mess up, that's okay. But what you'll be doing is something like this. Left, center, left, right, center, right, right, left, center. See how quickly you can do it and how well you can coordinate your verbal with your eyes, as well as eye-hand coordination and body motion. So there's a lot of things going on here that we're going to feed into your brain. And we're gonna do this for about 30 seconds. Ready, set, go. If you get to the bottom of the page, keep going, start again at the top. If you can go through the entire page in 30 seconds, fantastic. You're halfway there. Again, if you get to the bottom of the page, start again and continue on. You've got five seconds remaining. And time. All right. <sighs> okay. Now we can use that as a, just a fun tool and a fun exercise. But now that you've just stimulated the brain, why not check to see what the autonomic nervous system has in store for you? What, what did it feel like? So right now I'm balancing on my left leg. What's your single leg balance like? Did it improve? Did it get worse? Did nothing happen? Check your range of motion out with your shoulder. How was that? So it's just a fun way of working on coordination and remembering from the earlier in this conversation, the cerebellum is where we control or regulate accuracy, balance, and coordination. So if we can improve our coordination, we improve our balance potentially, and we may very well improve our accuracy.
Another fun drill that we'll do from time to time is all about echolocation and how accurate is your hearing in regards to a noise. So although I can't do this right now, I'll explain what it is and perhaps you and a friend or loved one could do this as kind of a fun little drill sometime, seeing we're all sheltered in place, what else are we gonna do, right? So what you would do is you would have somebody stand comfortably with their feet underneath them with their eyes closed. And then what you would do is standing fairly close to them within that six foot distance, you would just be snapping your finger somewhere around this circular place in front of their body. It could be down low, overhead, off to one side. And what they would be doing is they would be having their eyes closed and wherever you snap, they would have to point to it. And every time they point to it, they have to pause at that place and maintain that position of point and then open their eyes. You, meanwhile, will have snapped your fingers and kept your fingers where they are. So if they match up, what you'll sometimes find is that they don't match up. So when that happens, make sure they correct themselves and point to the hand that was snapping and then continue on with this. It's a really fun drill to improve echolocation and accuracy. And it, therefore, we're feeding information and stimuli to the cerebellum. Now, speaking of the cerebellum, there's another kind of assessment we could do, and that's called a RAPS test. And RAPS is an acronym for Rapid Alternating Pronation Supination. So when it comes to the hands, the hand position in terms of anatomy or anatomical speak, when the hand is flipped over with the palm face down, that's called pronation. And when the palm is flipped upward, that is called supination. And so this assessment is how rapidly can somebody flip their palm down and up? Now, what we do with this is what we're gonna have you do is take one hand with the palm up as a platform to rest the other hand upon. And it's going to be palm to palm. And what we'll be doing is keeping that resting platform right in front of your body. The palm that's on top, that hand is going to lift directly up. It's gonna flip over. And then the back of the palm is going to contact the same place. Then you lift the hand up, flip it back over and palm to palm comes again and landing again in the same place. So there's an accuracy that we're looking for, not only speed of alternating back and forth. And we'll do this for about 10 or 15 seconds. So I'll demonstrate first, and then I'll put the timer on. And what I'd like to have you do is see what is the quality of your flipping back and forth. And you do need to lift your hand completely off the other hand. There's no keeping the edge of your palm over and just simply going back and forth. That's not the assessment. What it is is lifting up fully, flipping over and contacting the same point. How rapidly can you do this? How accurately can you do this? And how long can you do it for? Chances are you're going to fatigue a little bit, but here's what it looks like. Okay, so I've got a timer here. Set yourself up, we'll start in five seconds. Whichever hand is on top, it's up to you because we're gonna do both. So start in three, two, one. Begin, back and forth, as quick as you can, as accurately as you can. Keep it going, keep it going. You're almost there. Five more seconds, keep going. And rest. Okay, so you've just assessed the quality of that side of your brain, that cerebellum. You've heard, yes, that the, the right side of the brain is controlled by the left side of the body and vice versa. However, when it comes to the cerebellum, it's actually what's called ipsilateral, meaning it's the same side. It more often than not, it really controls the same side of the body. So in regards to your right hand flipping up and back and forth, alternating pronation, supination, if that was the arm that was doing it, that was the side of the brain that you were just assessing. Now we're gonna do the other hand. We're gonna assess that side. Get yourself ready in three, two, one, begin. Back and forth, back and forth, touching the, the palm, back of the hand, palm. Go, go, go. Keep it up, keep it up. 
as accurate and as fast as possible. Five seconds, three, two, one, and rest. Okay. Most of the time, people are gonna notice there's a difference. It was either the accuracy, the speed, or the coordination. There's a whole bunch of things we're going in there. Okay. Whichever side was the least successful, we will the most challenged, the special side, however you'd like to say it. Let's do something to try and improve that. Now the cerebellum, that brain, that area of the brain, one, it likes novelty, meaning it doesn't like the same thing over and over. So your workouts that have 10 or 15 repetitions, maybe the first few repetitions will stimulate that area. But after a few of the same thing over and over, it says, I'm out of here. Let's send it somewhere else in the brain. So novelty is a big part of the cerebellum. So also is multi-directional movement. So what we're going to do is there's a sign for infinity, which is the figure eight on its side. Now, let's just say it was this side of my body, this is my left hand. So if it was my left side that didn't have the accuracy, the speed, or the coordination, whichever one it was, it was the most challenged one, that's the hand we're going to use for this next drill. And all you're going to do is you're going to take your thumb and you're going to trace the sign for infinity. And so you've got to make that sign back and forth. Make it a little bit bigger now. Bigger. Good, now let's make it smaller. Good, reverse direction, so it's the pinky finger that's doing it. A little bit faster. A little bit bigger. And rest. All right, we just spent what, 10, 15 seconds or so, just moving you through that, trying to stimulate the left side of the cerebellum. So let's check your alternating pronation and supination the wraps test once more. Same hand that we just used on top of the platform hand. Ready, set, and go. Back and forth, back and forth. Quickly as you can. Keep it up, keep it up. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, was there a change? Was there some improvement? could very well give you a little bit better contact accuracy. Maybe you were able to last longer without fatiguing or without getting errors. There's a whole bunch of things that could have happened there. Well, so we've dealt a little bit with the cerebellum. You know, we've, we've dealt uh, with the visual field, the vestibular field, the proprioceptive field, all these things feeding great information or stimuli up to the brain. Now, the other things that we can do in terms of brain health, which are more habitual, would be, at least according to many studies that I've read in terms of like neural plasticity, which is the brain's flexibility necessary in, in improving connections and, and adapting to, to the demands that you place upon it, two beneficial activities are reading and painting. So if you're an artist, wonderful, you're already ahead of the curve. But if you want to start doing some artwork, it's an amazing thing that you send up into your brain in terms of stimuli. And of course, reading. Now, uh, preferably an actual book, but it's okay if it's a screen. Uh, the things that won't necessarily help are video games and watching television. So if we can reduce our screen time and maybe pull out a canvas rather than a laptop, or a book, then I think we're gonna be a lot better off. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of food for thought and knowing that, ah, oh, all right, better lifestyle management in terms of my sleep pattern, uh, my food selection, and my ability to move my body are all feeding in some really nice brain health. And remember, this is 101, so I'm not gonna delve deep into any of those subjects. But we do offer consultations and training here. And this is not meant to be an infomercial. It's actually just to be informative. Uh, but I will say that, yeah, we do have services here that we can help you with. We work a lot with people that are recovering from issues in their neurological system, people that have been released from stroke rehab, um, cardiovascular rehab, 
people living with Parkinson's as well as MS um, and other kinds of things such as neuropathy, which is a decrease or a, a degradation of their nervous system, prefer typically in arms and legs. But uh, we work with a wide array of people. Mm -hmm.